Um, all right, let's get started. Um, I've got a quick introduction and then we're going to get right to the main event. Uh, questions with Jane. Oh, no, no, I can't see. Um, all right, so um, in case you didn't know, this is Ask a Futurist uh, with um, the Institute for the Future. Um, in case you're not familiar with Institute for the Future, we're the world's leading futures organization and our signature program, IFTF Vantage, is a unique partnership of innovative leaders that harness over 50 years of our global forecasts and research. Um, we aim to help organizations, communities, and individuals think systematically about the future. Um, and Ask a Futurist is a new and slightly actually less new free and public IFTF series sponsored by IFTF Vantage, uh, where our colleagues, uh, this time it's um, our Director of Games Research and Development, Jane McGonigal, uh, where our colleagues like her and myself get to hear questions from you and share insights from our research and our expertise. So. Um, in case you're curious about what is IFT Advantage, uh, we are, um, our partnership program offers our research as well as our expertise, as well as several signals of change that you'll see um, published in our past research on our website, as well as the opportunity to connect with other organizations um, in order to transform urgent foresight into actionable insights. I've got a couple of housekeeping items just as we're moving forward. Um, of course, we have a lot of questions from all of you, so we've selected some of those just to help the discussion move forward. Um, but again, if you haven't already, I know Joshua's introduced himself in the chat section. Please feel free to introduce yourself to others that are on the chat. Um, also ask um, questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, know that you can also upvote questions. So during the discussion, you think there's something that you really want to be sure that Jane addresses, please feel free to upvote those questions. Um, I'll be helping to moderate that and watching those questions come in. And everyone right now is muted. Your videos are turned off. But again, excited to hear all of your questions and keep a great dialogue going. And with that, I'll let Jane introduce herself and then we'll get right into the wonderful questions that you have all submitted. Hi, thanks, Vanessa. Um, good morning, everyone. Special hello uh, and shout out to our Coursera learners. Um, if you haven't checked out the Coursera specialization, you can take five courses on futures thinking. Um, with me as your lead instructor, Vanessa is a co-instructor for some of the courses as well. And um, it's free to audit and you can subscribe to get uh, actually earn a certificate in it. So uh, thanks for our global learners who join us today. Um, I am the Director of Game Research and Development at the Institute for the Future. I've been in that role since um, 2000. Seven. Um, I didn't start as a director. We just started doing the research and then became a director. Um, and I'm really excited because I think today we're going to have a chance to talk about um, some of the work we did a decade ago and what it feels like to be living in the future that we forecast and what we can learn about doing futures research going forward. Um, you know, if we can look back and say, what games were we playing 10 years ago and how did they prepare us for today? Did it, did it work? Did it help? Um, that can help us understand maybe what kinds of simulations and games we should be doing now to prepare us for whatever might come in 2030. All right, awesome. And leading right up to that, we had a question that asked, um, can you share some examples of past 2020 futures forecasting projects or research that have become real now that we can see in 2020? Yeah, and this has really been on my mind um, the last few weeks because some of you may know um, at the Institute for the Future, our first massively multiplayer forecasting game, we ran it in 2008 and it was a simulation of five different challenges that humanity might face in the year 2019. And one of those challenges was a global pandemic, a new respiratory illness um, called REDS, uh, short for Respiratory Distress Syndrome, um, was the fictional name for the virus. And um, we had almost 10,000 people spend um, eight weeks simulating the challenges of living in a world where there were rolling outbreaks, mandated quarantines, a lot of social distancing and self-quarantine. Um, and we asked people, this was a, this is not a simulation run by algorithms. This was a simulation powered by individual foresight, asking these almost 10,000 people to say, 
what challenges would you face? For example, if your office shut down and everybody had to work for home, from home for a month, or what challenges would you face if um, your schools were shut down and you had to educate your children from home? Um, if you were a, a practice, um, if you had a fellowship practice or spiritual practice, what would you do for um, your weekly fellowship if people were nervous about congregating in person or it was mandated by your local government that you could not have gatherings in person? And what was really great is that people brought whatever their actual life situation was to the simulation and, and people who were getting married had to think about, wait, what would I, would I actually hold the ceremony with all these people? <laughs> Um, people who were traveling to conferences, would I attend? Um, how could we hold the conference virtually? And so um, we learned so much. And Vanessa, I don't know if I could just kind of share maybe some of the things that we learned that have both proven really prescient, like there was a lot of foresight in them, um, and I think have allowed the people who participated in the forecast or people who read our reports on the forecast to maybe be in this moment now of 2020 with a little less anxiety, um, because I think a lot of people have anxiety right now about the coronavirus that's been spreading and wondering what, you know, how, how much action should I take um, or how will I get through this from a work situation or a personal family situation. I think people who were dealing hypothetically with these issues in our simulation, it doesn't change their reality, but it does change how much anxiety they feel in the face of it. So shall I share with you some of the things that we figured out that I think people who downloaded the, that aspect of the future um, over the past decade are, are kind of grappling with this with a little more confidence and a little more clarity? Yeah, I would love to hear that, especially, you know, you know, we know too that when people think about the future, sometimes they get anxious, especially when it's something like contemplating a pandemic. So speak to like, what their experience was at the time of imagining this future and maybe like what, you know, what their experience is of it now and like contrast. Yeah, so what was really interesting is we just asked people to either change their real life behaviors as if the pandemic were real and kind of see how flexible their lives were. Um, and uh, also to um, just at least hypothetically imagine the problems they'd encounter. And one thing we saw was how incredibly difficult it was to shake certain social norms, whether it was the norm of shaking hands or sharing food and beverages in, a, in certain communal contexts, um, that, no, that no matter how much motivation we have to stay healthy, we have a higher motivation to not offend others or to not be shunned socially. And um, it's been really interesting, even looking at the communications from the CDC and from the World Health Organization, um, right now during our current pandemic, they talk about how important it is to wash your hands immediately after shaking hands with someone, um, where that is known to be the most effective way to spread the coronavirus is through touch. It lives on the hands really effectively, even more so than in the air. They're not even recommending that you stop shaking hands because it's so socially ingrained. Um, and our players really tested that boundary um, and uh, kind of tried to innovate, like what are the alternatives to shaking hands so that you can still feel socially accepted um, and and practice what feels appropriate social distancing to you. Anyway, so what, what we learned, a lot of people tried the elbow bump. I am here to say that that is actually pretty awkward. Um, I do it sometimes, <laughs> but like when you go at people with your elbow, it kind of looks like you're throwing a jab. It's a fighting move. <laughs> yeah, and they're like, what? Uh, uh. <laughs> um, but the one that has been, um, that our players found most effective and that I'm practicing most often uh, now myself is just putting your hand over your heart because it has that that sense of warmth to it um, and giving it a slight lean in so you're still you know approaching because a handshake is a, is a way of saying I'm approaching you and I'm, I'm safe and um, want to connect with you and saying I'm very happy to meet you right or I don't shake hands but I'm very happy to meet you and um, looking at just the small changes that people can make in their everyday behaviors to be more resilient, no matter what's going on in a health situation, sure. um, to give yourself permission to adopt a different social behavior and to be comfortable with the discomfort of kind of catching people off guard and then sort of being able to move yourself into the confidence to behave differently. Um, it takes time. And what we're seeing now is that, um, you know, there's not enough time for people to change 
their behaviors or get comfortable with that extreme a change. And so having time to kind of practice it and change the social norms um, is really important. Um, we're also just seeing the importance of what we did see, and I think we're seeing now, is the importance of being kind and gentle with each other in terms of having the sort of maximum flexibility to socially distance yourself if you want to create kind of a safer space for yourself, um, if people want to work from home, being employers being more explicit that you will not lose your job, that it's safe to stay home if you have symptoms or you um, are somebody who's um, at higher risk for complications and you need that space um, to be as progressive as we can, um, particularly if there might be family members who need that support. Essentially, there needs to be like a loosening of our um, how tightly we hold to productivity standards, to um, to to the to the sort of desire to always be on and getting things done. That there needs to be kind of like a global softening around that, and we're certainly um, people practicing that softening over the past decade. I think are able to kind of move into this strange future where maybe you can't follow through on a commitment that you made um, because you're not feeling comfortable to travel, or you're not feeling um, the conference is you know not happening where you were going to give this talk that you've been preparing for the last three months. Um, how do we soften expectations and kind of gracefully allow more fluidity in, in terms of um, our commitments and our responsibilities? Um, I mean, there's, there's obviously a, a lot going on with research on the harder side of pandemics and how do you create vaccines and how do you, um, how do you provide a cure? But for the rest of us, where the primary symptom of the coronavirus in 2020 is anxiety, and panic and overreaction and xenophobia, um, having some practice at dealing with these emotions 10 years ago, um, it seems provides um, a kind of a buffer for people to not overreact, not over panic, um, not um, shun others who might have been in quarantine and be moving out of it um, or who might have uh, a, a particular ethnic background, like all of that, um, having time to spend with these difficult emotions before it actually happens um, allows us to make, I think, more rational decisions. Uh, I love that because it's, you know, like you're saying, like living the future today and thinking about it. Um, and part of what comes to mind when I hear you talking about it is like, I've seen a lot of articles and even now people starting to form uh, maybe like rituals around like dealing with climate anxiety, like eco anxiety. And so knowing that this might be, you know, as we look at the next decade, the sort of next version of what this can be, maybe it's not pandemic, but it's climate. Mm. Um, and, you know, you know, I think that that's a good opportunity for, again, for folks to come together and figure out how do we navigate this? Like we haven't quite hit that point yet where it's maybe hitting all of us, but we certainly have seen enough extreme weather events where, we know. Oh, you know, I'm so glad you raised this topic because there is, there has been kind of an inflection point in clinical practice um, in, in, I mean, you're, I'm sure you've been seeing this in psychology and um, psychotherapy where uh, we, we've had a lot of practitioners raising their hands and saying, um, hold up, I think we're essentially creating a kind of pre-traumatic disorder in the younger generation. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to post-traumatic disorder where you've already been traumatized and you're living with the after effects, we've got this generation that is imagining the bleakest future possible that really believes in um, what they're seeing in the science of climate change and they're expecting the world to be a very difficult place to live in and they're pre-grieving the loss of, of a climate that they've barely been able to experience um, that there's a lot of concern that maybe we've gone too far, but this particular generation is experiencing extreme anxiety and depression um, about, about a trauma that hasn't even really fully been Thank inflicted you. yet, yeah. um, as if it's inevitable. And, you know, Vanessa, we at the Institute for the Future, we're always talking about how no future is inevitable, mm -hmm. that we're not here to predict the future and then just wait for it to happen, but we're here to shape the future and participate in deciding what happens and that we may have gone too far around 
climate, at least for this particular group, because there obviously there are groups that are resisting climate action um, or maybe are just not motivated to make global systemic changes yet. They need, they need maybe a little more anxiety. Um, but yeah, what exactly. need is depression and to traumatize a whole generation, like the generation that we're counting on to do a lot of the work. The le leading our nations and and being our scientists and being our engineers and our thought leaders to help us adapt and mitigate climate change. So um, I think you've raised a really interesting idea of you know what would a simulation of the climate of the future look like that would allow us to maybe safely grieve and feel anxious, but in that hypothetical scenario to come up with innovations that feel hopeful and optimistic. Because I'll tell you, the thing that I took out of the quarantine simulation that we ran in 2008 was there was so much innovation around how would we stay socially connected while socially distanced if we were required to quarantine or we just felt like it was the socially appropriate thing for my family to basically just hunker down for a few weeks, what would we do? And um, so many, you know, I mean, we had ministers coming up with ideas for virtual um, congregation. We had fitness trainers coming up with, you know, what what is the, I mean, be, you know, pre Peloton, like how do we um, work yeah. out <laughs> in our in our homes and um, and what is you know online learning look like? I mean, ten years ago, online learning was not what we see today, and people were just starting to practice really um, vigorously in that space. And and we had early online educators thinking about that, and and we're we're seeing all of that happen again now, especially in China. Um, people trying to invent these methods of being together alone, right? Together alone. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, but it was very, there was a lot of positive energy around that innovation. Once you, once you started the simulation and you terrified yourself and you were like very anxious about what would actually happen to move through that and, and have a, a period where it was safe to be creative because it wasn't so urgent and dire and you could allow that creativity to flourish. I wonder if simulating adaptation to different levels of climate change now would allow us to access some really amazing creativity, the kind that we need to solve these problems um, before we are so overwhelmed with the, the grief and trauma of the change having actually happened. Yeah, like I think question. it's something that especially, you know, yeah, IFTF Vantage, like we're an organizational program. And so, you know, I know a lot of our partners, of course, they're thinking about climate change. They're trying to adapt sustainability strategies. You know, they're trying to think about their workforce and what does that mean for them. But at the same time, like, this is just something that's so big and so overwhelming. And so the ability to feel that together with other people that are similarly, yes, feeling overwhelmed, but finding a way, like you said, to like give them some space to think through it is something that's obviously really powerful. And, um, it's, and, and Vanessa, what you said, it's not like, I know some people might be like, Ugh, this doesn't sound very practical. This doesn't sound like actionable what do you mean just like feel the future like how like prove to me that this is actually going to help me because i have real problems to solve and strategies to organize but you know i mean the the neuroscience is very clear that when you're anxious or depressed your ability to make good decisions is greatly compromised and particularly your ability to make decisions that have long-term benefits when you have a high anxiety or high depression um, it's very hard for you to resist short-term payoffs um, versus much bigger long-term benefits um, because literally your ability to envision the future, it kind of, it kind of vanishes. Like the, mm -hmm. the areas of your brain that are able to um, simulate and visualize in your mind what a long-term future might be like, they kind of power down. It's only the shortest term futures that are really resonant for you. So um, what we're trying to do by addressing the emotional aspect of how we respond to challenges is to um, essentially train our brains to be more resilient when actual challenges arise and these kinds of global threats that we're living through um, more and more it seems to to have a brain that is able to focus and go and move past the overwhelming negative emotions faster Mm -hmm. and to find find that space so it's I mean it's really a kind of brain training that you have to do before you get to, to the actual fight or flight moment right. yeah. Yeah. The brain is not easy to train when you're in in the thick of it yeah yeah 
I love that. So what do you think that we as futurists then can do to train our brains so that we can then be prepared, help people, other people prepare? Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things that I really like, you and I have talked about this before, um, we have a tool at the Institute called For Future Feelings, um, which is really great for stretching your imagination. Um, actually, I don't know if we, have we, did we talk about that on the last uh, webinar we did together? We might've done a different game. Um, I think we did a different one. I don't think we know. Yeah, okay, let's talk yeah. about that one then. Um, For Future Feelings is one of my favorite tools. It's, it's, it comes from the research literature, um, which was uh, kind of, it came from a, a, a research area um, uh, prospection, basically looking for interventions that could improve people's ability to devise long-term strategies that were rated more likely to be effective, more surprising, more original, more innovative, um, and more resilient. Like basically, um, could you devise 10 different strategies to get to the same outcome, each of them um, kind of increasing your likelihood of it. So basically, what, what should you do to your brain to improve that ability to create more creative, resilient, long-term strategies. Um, and surprisingly, they found that having you imagine that future you were trying to get towards from multiple different emotional perspectives was a really powerful way to generate more diverse and resilient strategies. So what they would have you do is pick four different emotions. And this is what we replicate with our tool, um, two positive and two negative, and try to imagine uh, a moment where you would feel that feeling in the future. So, um, you know, uh, one of the teaching tools that I use is imagining um, a severe water shortage where the government has imposed really strict water limits. Um, this was inspired by um, the actual policies in Cape Town um, over the last couple of years. They, wow. they had an uh, incredibly severe water shortage and people were living um, with extreme water restrictions. So when we teach this tool, we have people imagine if you didn't personally live through that, imagine where you live um, has similar water restrictions and what you might feel in that future. Um, and so there's like this nice diagram that you can use with the tool and we teach this in our Coursera class of, you know, uh, basically you can like either flush your toilet three times um, or shower, or you can wash your clothes and give your dog water. I mean, there's all these trade-offs, right? And sure. you're picking every day you wake up. Do I shower today or do I flush my toilet? Do I give my dog water or do I cook um, for myself? Um, and so um, can you imagine in the future where you're making all these trade-offs and have all these restrictions, um, feeling grateful? Can you imagine feeling proud, I mean, you might pick those two positive emotions. And then two negative emotions. Can you imagine feeling embarrassed? Or can you imagine feeling angry? Angry, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Vanessa, can you, we wanna pick one of those emotions and uh, play this out for me. Pick a positive one and a negative one. So we can kind of demo how this works. Sure, uh, let's go. I mean, we're talking a lot about anxiety. So that sounds like a good negative one and then a positive one, um, grateful. Okay, yeah, so go. Pick up. Uh, what would you feel grateful in the future? for a severe water shortage. Um, what might happen in this future? We could tell a little story. Sure, a story about the future where I feel grateful about severe water shortage. Not about the water shortage, but maybe grateful to somebody. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that I would feel grateful for maybe the opportunity for closeness um, in a certain sense, because maybe the water wasting isn't happening. You know, we're not just going to the pool and idly sitting aside, um, sitting around a pool or just having, um, what is it? I've been to Palm Springs before and they have those very grassy like golf courses and having places like that where people just sort of take nature for granted. So maybe my time spent in, in nature, I feel a lot more grateful for it because these are the things that have survived, that have persisted and have their own natural beauty as a result of, of survival. And this being the sort of space that's around me where the earth is still giving, even though it's experiencing this constraint. Um, I like that. I think, yeah. I love that. Um, if I were to tell a grateful story, and mine might even be like more, that's a very sort of like almost spiritual gratitude. I'm thinking like <laughs> a more mundane gratitude. Like if my neighbor let me, you know, have a little bit of what they had excess water um, so that I could both, you know, 
be give my dog water and also you know cook for my family tonight like i think there would be a lot of sharing and coordinating of resources in this future um and that that might in a similar way create a closeness um with your local community right um the people you can physically share water with you know who who is within that physical proximity and being more aware of physical proximity um it's interesting another future forecasting game we ran world without oil um, in 2007 we had people simulate a severe oil shortage and one of the things that those players discovered was that um, in a fuel shortage you would actually come to rely on the people who were within essentially walking or biking distance much more heavily and many players of that game reported in the months and years following making more of an investment, a conscious investment in knowing their neighbors, in cultivating friendships. If they met somebody who lived within physical, a real physical proximity, putting more emphasis on those relationships, sort of thinking towards that future where physical proximity might really be more important. Mm -hmm. um, and um, anyway, that's, that's a callback to another game. Um, for embarrassment, uh, when, when might you be embarrassed in this future? Huh. I really put you on the spot. This is, I know. This is not you know, I think, you know, I think embarrassment, you know, putting my mind as we were speaking about, you were speaking about story from parenting this morning, just thinking about it, you know, if I'm a parent in the future and there's something that my, my child, I couldn't have, I would feel embarrassed as a parent, not being able to give that to them. So if it's my child's birthday party, or actually that would be it. Like it's my child's birthday and we can't have a party because the amount of water we have for that day simply does not support having a party and having people over. Like this is the only amount of water that we have. And maybe I'm too worried to ask other families because I think it's important. Yeah. Oh, that really touches my heart. You know, it's because um, uh, that's another topic with the quarantine game that we saw come up was, was actually kids' birthday parties. Yeah. Um, you know, when do we make good rational decisions and when do our emotions kind of lead us to do things that are maybe not in our best interest? And, um, you know, I, rem I distinctly remember a player struggling with, would I have the, I guess, the emotional courage to cancel my kid's birthday party um, because it's not a good idea to have that kind of a, um, social closeness right now and what could i provide because you know a kid's tears i mean we're gonna make and we've we've actually i mean what we've seen with this current outbreak is um is it appears that certain decisions about um continuing with a family banquet or continuing with certain and traditions anniversaries has, and birthdays yeah has uh created some super spreading situations um so um, yeah, that touches. So basically, um, anyway, so kind of thinking about these range of emotions. Sure. And the more it, it allows you to create some granularity to a future situation. And we do it with all kinds of things like, you know, if there was a new neurosensing technology that could read um, your emotions and, and share them with trusted friends and family, maybe neurosensing in the future is more like WhatsApp and you have like different social groups. You can, this, these groups only get your positive emotions. These groups get all your emotions, or maybe you're publicly broadcasting them. We don't know. Maybe neurosensing will be more like Twitter in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, asking people, when might you feel embarrassed in that future? When might you feel grateful in that future? When might you feel proud? Like what, what would pride feel like? And I'm proud to share a certain emotion. What would, what emotion would I be proud to share or, um, or even maybe feeling someone else's pride, you know, when somebody else has an accomplishment and I can literally feel their pride through the neurosensing text of what does vicarious pride feel like. All of this, it just starts to give texture to things that we might have an initial reaction to like, oh my God, I hope that never happens. Or, oh, I don't want that. I don't want to wake up in that future. That sounds like a black mirror dystopia. Um, it, it provides granularity and gives us just a little more substantive raw material to play with as we think about these kind of abstract um, or overwhelming possibilities. Um, so that is a that is a tool that I use regularly to train my brain since going back to your question, what can we as futurists do to train our brains? Um, you know, when you encounter any kind of scenario or forecast, one you've created or somebody else, come at it with, with these multiple emotions, try to simulate yourself in it yourself. And then the best thing is when you get lots of people to do this tool, it allows you to see the future from multiple perspectives so you can get outside your own brain and realize, oh, parents are gonna have a different 
reaction. Somebody who's aging is going to have a different reaction. Um, somebody who is young and still, you know, driven by the, these really powerful instincts to go out and socialize and mate and all of that, they're going to have different reactions. Um, and being able to see the future from everybody's feelings um, is what gives us, I think, that kind of empathy at scale that we need to make a future that's better for everyone. Yeah. And I love that you're saying like that gives us empathy at scale. Like this is an opportunity for people to come together and navigate this, the both optimism that can come from this as well as the difficult pieces of that as well. Right. Because foresight is not something you should practice alone. Like yes. don't do it alone. Even team if sport. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is foresight. It's a team sport um, because er the future affects everyone differently and everyone has a different skill set to bring to building the future. Um, so the more, the better. Yeah. Um, yes, so I'm going and thinking about emotions. So someone was curious about thinking about, speaking of emotions, like how might emotions be influenced maybe going into the future? Like I know obviously there's been a lot of um, different text signals about social media and how that influences our emotions. And like you're saying, all the media coverage of things like the coronavirus, and how that might influence, or climate rather, and in influencing us. So maybe what might be some of the drivers of big emotional influence that we can think about? I think the microbiome is going to be the biggest driver of emotion. Uh, <laughs> our gut is going to drive. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the the um, the colonies of bacteria in our intestines are going to be um, kind of like when we think about the future, we think of like, what levers do we have to press to create change? Of course. Um, and the research on how mood um, and, and mental illness um, and, men and very even different various mental disorders um, are exacerbated or activated through our microbiome um, is really tremendous. Um, the, you know, the, we're in this kind of holding pattern right now in that there are do not seem to be effective techniques necessarily for changing the microbiome from a, a clinical intervention or medical intervention. Um, you know, it, it's not that like fecal matter transplants are not have not really taken off in a safe and scalable way where mm -hmm. you could say, oh, somebody test somebody's microbiome and say they they have a a gut that is really um, conducive to depression and anxiety. Let's change it out. Let's get some better germs in there. Um, it's really complex. So if we had if we had that kind of clinical intervention, safe and scalable, we'd be seeing this now because I think um, there's uh, indisputable evidence that a lot of our mood and, and mental disorders are um, are exacerbated by the changing microbiome. And right now. The best thing we could say is like eat eat a diverse diet and probiotics, prebiotics. Yeah, <laughs> certain certain plants seem to be you know the more plants the better, and um, you can kind of try to hack your own biome. Um, but um, you know, ten years from now, certainly twenty years from now, it seems like if you want uh, if you want to change at scale societal depression and anxiety, we're going to be doing it through through either food that's been engineered, um, plants that have been engineered to affect the microbiome in particular ways, um, or you know, maybe just like we get flu shots annually, we'll be getting you know, fecal transplants annually. We do it through the water, you know, it's like, like fluoridation, <laughs> the new fluoridation. <laughs> I think that's the number one thing people should take away from this webinar today is uh, it's 2030, have you gotten your annual fecal transplant yet? Um, it's your social responsibility um, to control oh, wow. your anxiety and depression through your annual transplant. Um, which, you know, I mean, and we would say future is, does it sound good to you? Does it sound scary to you? I mean, some people may think that sounds terrible. Some people may think, I love that idea, if we can uplift, you know, anyway. Yeah. Uh, that's it's empowering, but it's also great to know if I decide to opt out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that would be a great feature to play for, for future feelings with. Yeah, I love that. So if you get off the webinar today and you play for future feelings, thinking about, you know, your social responsibility to have a fecal transplant. <laughs> <laughs> Talk or around the water cooler. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's see in the way of other questions. That would make a great artifact for the future, by the way. 
um, to put up like your water cooler at work, you know, like the signs that say, hey, it's the annual flu shot clinic, make a poster flyer from the year yeah. 2030. Um, and, and uh, you know, kind of provoke, because that's another way we provoke feelings about the future, right? By creating artifacts that kind of blur the line between um, like, is this real or is this from the future? And give people that chance to have an emotional reaction before they have the rational reaction to hearing about it. Um, and my pro tip lately, by the way, I'm really um, convinced that every time we make an artifact from the future, we need to put a link like URL or QR code to uh, signals or research that inspired the artifact. So that somebody who sees a flyer for their fecal annual fecal transplant in the year 2030 can go to this link and read about the research and, and start to prepare rationally as well as like intellectually as well as having that emotional reaction they can learn the signal so put put research links on your artifacts people that's my pro tip oh, yay. all right let's see what other questions we've got right now um someone's curious about basically changing the culture of a corp, like a corporation when thinking about training our brains. Like how do you do that within an organization that may be used to thinking about the world in a particular way? Yeah, I mean, we, one thing we try to do is we try to point to the research literature, um, whether it's, you know, um, McKinsey did a great report looking at over 600 um, US-based firms and comparing over an eight year period their, um, their revenue, their growth, um, how many jobs they created, market cap compared to their peers. Um, and they were doing a, a, a study of companies that were thinking along 10 year timelines and longer that had rigorous strategic foresight practices that were had des product design cycles that were longer than six months or nine months or 12 months, but were really stretching out to five, seven and 10 year timelines. Um, and so you can show within your organization, um, and that's, uh, I mean, I think that's, that's when you, that's right at the top of our vantage membership. Yeah, you know, always. <laughs> one of the first things we do is share with you that research so that you are armed with data that says, um, making these kinds of investments in strategic foresight is, it's not just, it's not, it's not just about being more innovative, although it is, it's not just about being responsible because you have, if you want to have a positive impact on society and humanity in the long term, you have to be thinking in the long term. So it's, it's better innovation, it's better responsibility, but it's also just better bottom line. Um, and, uh, and, and so there are various longitudinal studies on this as well. So I think just getting the data um, to show that it's good for business um, is helpful. And then I do think, um, I do think there's an increasing, you know, responsibility component um, to uh, that there is essentially no way to be a good actor um, as an organization unless you are really thinking about the long-term futures um, and paying attention to the forces um, outside of your organization that will be impacting your ability to serve your constituency or can serve your customers um, or serve your community um, that that uh, we all need to be paying more attention to the more complex forces around us so that we can um, we can serve each other better yeah I love that I guess that sense of responsibility that comes from working through the feelings today about thinking about not getting grounded in that short-term thinking and yeah I mean because it's like Ultimately, we're, nobody's making a product in a silo. Nobody is providing a service in a silo. We're all dealing with forces of whether it's climate change or the rise of um, weaponization of hate of, via the internet and social media. I mean, we're all living in increasing economic inequality and uh, you just can't, whatever your mission or purpose is, if you're not actively thinking about those human planetary scale challenges, um, whatever your sort of smaller role within humanity is, you're not effectively dealing with it. Yeah. All right, let's see. We've got a few um, questions about maybe what things that you're working on right now um, that's really exciting. And then I know we had another one that was like, what's, oh, 
actually, let's ask this. What's uh, some exciting research that you come across that's changing the way that you're thinking about foresight? Because we've had a few, what are the changes in foresight we can anticipate or that are needed? Yeah, um, you know, um, there's some really exciting work happening right now in the space of machine learning and neuroscience, which are, they're very complementary kind of symbiotic fields of research now where um, if you figure out how to train uh, an AI better, um, you can have come up with better mechanisms for um, for creating neural networks that are more able to learn faster um, and perform more effectively, that that can be translated back to the field of neuroscience where we can look for evidence that something that's a better algorithm for an AI might better reflect how their brain works. And there was a breakthrough that was um, just published in the last month where they discovered something about um, essentially optimism and pessimism and, um, and how they work in AI and how they work in, in human brains. So I can try to like share, I mean, the, the sort of the high level answer is the symbiosis between AI neural networks and neuroscience is, is a really important space to be looking. And whenever, whenever both fields say aha at the same time, that's like something really important to pay yeah. attention to. That's a high level. I'll try to give like the three minute if I can, version of this really powerful insight that they had. Um, so some of the earlier algorithms for learning um, to help a machine get better at predicting the future, um, it, was, it, was, it would you know, try something and then it would measure the effects. Did it work, did it not work? How effective was it? And it would do that a hundred times or a thousand times and it would average out the outcomes and say, okay, if I take this action, then, you know, the benefit to me averages out to be, you know, let's say 10 of whatever um, measurement I'm using to evaluate effectiveness, right? But that might mean, uh, a 10 might mean that I get zero payoff for this action, you know, uh, 100 times, but I get a thousand one time or whatever, the, I'm not going to do whatever that. the number. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just the idea. Um, or it might mean that every time I do this, I get 10. It's perfectly consistent. So it's like, Oh, do it 10, do it 10. That's a very different scenario than fail 99 times and get nothing. But one time I get a really big payoff. Um, but if you're just do, looking at the average, you're teaching the, the AI, the same thing. And, in, yeah. and if we were in, in a real world situation where I could get 10 every time or only got a really big payoff one time, we would actually behave very differently, right? How yeah. much humans would, but machines will you invest in a perfect payout versus a very um, unreliable payout. Um, so uh, so what, they've, what they've determined is more effective for AIs is to essentially allow it to have um, multiple predict, make multiple predictions every time, some more pessimistic, some more optimistic, and that um, as it continues to learn, instead of just flattening it out to one average, it creates this kind of map or landscape um, that allows it to be making um, some pessimistic uh, predictions and some optimistic predictions, and then kind of paying more attention to the pessimistic or optimistic ones, depending on how frequently they turn out to be right. And when the researchers went to see if this is actually how the human brain works, they were able to find evidence. Actually, they found it in mice. So, okay. So <laughs> the mouse brains definitely work the same way, um, where they were actually able to identify specific dopamine neurons that are responsible for optimistic predictions versus pessimistic predictions. And it appears that some people's brains um, pay more attention to the optimistic ones than they should, and that can lead to mania. Um, and some people pay more attention to the pessimistic neurons than they should, and that that can lead to depression. And uh, if we could figure out a way to basically retrain the brain, to have a more accurate, uh, in the way that we're training the AI, to be as accurate as possible, when, when should you be pessimistic, when should you be optimistic, and in what balance, um, that that may be a really effective mental health intervention. Um, and so they're just, I mean, that's, it's just the start of discovery now. They don't know how they're gonna do it. Um, but to, to know that, that 
that, that you can actually separate out on an individual neuron by neuron level, where's your optimism coming from? Where's your pessimism coming from? Um, and who do you want to listen to? It's like having, you know, the angel, the angel and the, the devil. devil. Yeah. Um, uh, and me personally, I'm very interested in um, what we know from game research is that games, because they're designed for you ultimately to be successful over time, um, games are not designed to just hammer you into submission. Um, they, they're designed for you to get better and eventually succeed and grow your skills and get more effective and more powerful, um, that they seem to definitely put the spotlight on the optimistic neurons. And that may be why we see in the research literature that gamers are kind of super optimistic, even in situations where they may have less control. They, they kind of have this like oh uh, heightened, they listen to the, the optimistic neurons because they've had so much experience of, um, of those reinforcement. Yeah. 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 So um, all of that, that's a kind of swirling pool of possibility thinking about how do we help people be more optimistic about the future? How do we help them not be optimistic when they shouldn't be because it's kind of delusional? I mean, there's a whole spectrum of possibility here, but uh, yeah, hang yeah. hanging out with, with machine learning specialists and neuroscientists at the same time is where a very cool set of stuff is happening. Very cool. That sounds like a really great intersection to be at and thinking about how we can game optimism and game pessimism. Yeah, and that is just, it's not like out of our control. And yeah, uh, yeah that there yeah. are mechanics for it is very cool. Yeah, and I think because we've had like a few, there were a lot of different questions about like gaming, like in the workplace and maybe getting to like, how can people feel included um, maybe through games or through, um, yeah, basically thinking about inclusion or even preparing the future workforce. Um, so it sounds like this might be a way of thinking about like future workforce, maybe training them to know when to be optimistic and when to be pessimistic in the workplace could be. Yeah, I mean, if from a very simple hack, I mean, my, my, my brain immediately goes to the, from a, from a mobile game design perspective, one of the, when mobile gaming really started to take off, especially casual games and social games that people wanted to appeal to as many people as possible, the most diverse and inclusive set of gamers possible. Um, the kind of holy grail like principle of game design was that the player has to experience success in the first 30 seconds, or you have failed as a game designer. You, you have got to give them an experience of success within the first 30 seconds um, because that will, you know, Teach, start teaching them like, oh, this is a space where I can be successful, where my actions will have a positive impact. So imagine if that were a workplace rule, you know, first day of work, every employee has to experience, <laughs> maybe not the first 30 seconds, maybe it's the first 30 minutes, but you kind of engineer the environment and the onboarding so that they have um, these, these, you know, you, you are purposely um, looking for ways to provide them with experiences of success where, um, you know, they have the chance to make a decision and actually see it go into action where they've gotten praise from, you know, a manager where they have um, been given a chance to, to see the impact of an action that they take and it's a positive. Um, if you can engineer that in to their first day or their first week, um, that, that would, I think, help sort of um, create that sense of, optimism and agency that we get in games, um, but bring it to a context where we don't always feel so agentful. Yeah, I think there's increasingly all of us are moving into situations where we don't say, feel so agentful <laughs> with the I thing. I think agentful is a word now, by the way. Somebody okay. should feel it for us, but I've, I've heard it being used lately and I wanna encourage people that it's, like it, it's an interesting word to take up right now. Um, mm -hmm. Like how much agency do you have? It's not, it's not confidence. Confidence is like an assessment of your own skills and abilities, whereas agency is takes into account the environment. You know, yeah. it's not just do I have skills and competencies, but will the environment um, allow me to effectively use them so that the actions I take actually make a difference? And so, you know, beyond confidence, we want people to feel agentful that they have um, real agency. In their yeah. Life. Like I know like in public health, we talk a lot about like self-efficacy. Like, do you feel like you have the capability to actually exercise whatever is either being asked of you or demanded of you? Yeah. Um, and maybe on the flip side of that, someone asked a question about that, like thinking about the uncanny valley and like, where can we 
maybe either anticipate where that is or how do we see maybe the, the world kind of navigating that uncanny valley and like where it's shifting over time. Right, you get like in terms of visual simulation and um, avatars and um, yeah. graphics. This is where technologies are going, like where, how do we, how does that either decrease over time or how do we see that decreasing? Yeah, I mean, to me, the most interesting spaces for simulation right now are actually in um, audio simulation. Oh. Um, so, uh, you know, there's been a lot of technological advancements where if you have um, a variety of speech samples from an individual, you can teach uh, essentially a, a vocal agent to say anything um, with the same inflection and speech patterns and um, tone of voice um, as that person. And so I think the original test case was on Joe Rogan because uh, he's done so many uh, hours of podcasts that it's really uh -huh. easy to find a large um, scale of vocal samples. And so there's like now a Joe Rogan um, vocal agent where you can make Joe Rogan say anything you want. Um, and it really sounds like him. And so in thinking about like this webinar, for example, is providing the world for both of us, more for me, because I've been blabbing so much, sorry, <laughs> Vanessa, um, but providing the world with the vocal samples for me. Um, and our, if you have a smart speaker at home and, or you, if you're talking to Alexa or Google Assistant um, on your phone a lot, uh, every time you speak to it, it's getting more of your vocal samples. Um, I think the uncanny valley of the future um, will likely be around audio. Um, and I'm really curious what we're going to do with this capability when we can simulate anybody's voices. I mean, um, that's a space that I have seen hardly any foresight devoted to yeah. considering how quickly the technology is advancing. Um, I don't have I haven't seen anybody present the positive version of this future. What, what does it do for humanity to have these vocal agents um, uh, and the ability to simulate any individual person effectively? I honestly have a hard time coming up with like, what does the utopian version of that future look like? I honestly don't know what we're planning to do with them. That makes me say, that sounds like a good idea. I would love to see more efforts by the technologists and the engineers and computer scientists to explain what is this research in service of? What, you know, what, 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 you know, what's the ultimate goal? What is the trade-offs that we're making? <laughs> the picture where we're healthier, happier, more productive, you yeah. know, more, more, more socially um, supported, like whatever, paint that picture. Um, I can think of plenty of sort of negative uses of the technology from like, harassment and bullying and hate and, um, you know, disinformation and propaganda and, and cynical marketing. And there's a lot of, so um, please let's explore that future together, that Uncanny Valley. And the last thing I'll say about Uncanny Valley is um, within my sort of smaller private social network groups and, and colleague groups, there's been a ton of discussion around a news story of um, a VR designer engineer who created for his um, mother a simulation of um, his sister who had passed at a very young age. Yeah. Um, he created a VR version of this lost daughter um, for his mom to spend time with. And there's video you can watch of it and it's very emotional. Um, one of the signals I think we're, we're sharing um, in our, uh, with our Vantage partners right now, um, trying to make sense of it, a lot of people in my game design, VR development community, comp science community, they're, they have a very negative visceral reaction to this, that it's unethical to create um, these kinds of simulations of, of loved ones that we've lost. And I have, it, the conversations are just starting to happen, right? This is a brand new news story, but at a deep level, people feel uncomfortable with this. And it's, it's interesting because you know, my mind was like, wow, what a great gift to provide somebody to spend time with a lost loved one. Um, but so my reaction was initially quite positive, but I'm seeing a lot of uneasiness around it. And, and like people can't even articulate why, but that it seems 
almost exploitative to provide this to people. Um, and so anyway, that's the, v the ability to recreate individuals in VR um, after they have passed, either because they have died or they've left our lives, but maybe that you know ex-boyfriend or girlfriend that you still feel for. Or, yes, I've, I've seen a couple of examples. Our version of them forever. What are the ethics of that? I mean, anyway, that's a whole, so it's like the new Uncanny Valley, but it's not gonna be about like the brain rejecting it, but maybe like from, an, what's the ethical Uncanny Valley? Um, of these simulations and and so it's and it's not just going to be this sort of visual um it's it's really going to be about virtual the full bodied uncanny valley and also from a, the vocal agents and, and the audio uncanny valley yeah so an uncanny future we have <laughs> I know, and they just think in 20 years those of us who are you know still here we're going to be living with this as an ordinary reality and it's going to seem so mundane to us mm -hmm. That's the, that's the strangest thing about the future, right? Is that by the time it happens, it seems it feels normal. normal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much it on our time. Jane, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation um, and answering all these questions and uh, really closing, I think, on a really beautiful example of, you know, where our emotions can both lead us in the future and like where we may be thinking of them in the future. Um, I just wanted to close out. I'm just going to put up this one slide just so you can see. As I said, um, Ask a Futurist is a series um, sponsored by IFTF Vantage that we're doing throughout the year. We have, um, just to tell you about the next two sessions we have coming up in May, we'll have David Peskovitz. We'll be talking about art and science fiction um, in Foresight. And then in August, we'll have uh, Research Director Toshi Hu, who will be speaking about um, cross reality, so augmented reality, virtual reality, um, and we're um, asking him questions about that. Um, and just to close things out, because I know we're on time, um, for those of you who don't know, IFTF Vantage, this is our topic that we're exploring, exploring this year, Beyond Tomorrow, Aligning the Future Focused Organization for 2030. Um, if you're curious about where our research is going, we're really looking at what makes organizations future ready, so whether it's things like feeling our way to the future as we explore today with Jane, um, looking at science and technological breakthroughs and capabilities that can emerge, um, and really how can organizations operate in systems to be more resilient to shocks and changes um, that are coming into the future. Um, these are the three questions that we are exploring. How do you build long-term thinking? Um, what new capabilities are emerging from science and te technology? And how can you reorganize to navigate the systems level change? Um, if you're curious about IFTF Vantage for your organization, please feel free to reach out to Sean Ness. And with that, I just wanted to, again, say thank you and close <coughs> Thank you to all of our fantastic participants. Yeah, uh, thank the for, comments. I'm reading all the comments in the chat. Um, thank you very much. Yes, um, and this is wonderful hearing. I know that it's always hard to get to all of the questions that we have, but we had, we had a lot submitted. And so uh, looking forward to having all of you join the next Ask a Future.